Okay, everybody's got snacks, water, evaluations, log signed in. Followed all of the directions. Excellent. I'm just going to shut the door so my voice doesn't bother everyone else. Welcome to the How To Talks. This is a series promoted by the Wright Center and Thompson McCall Library for the Health Sciences and the VCU Post Doctoral Association, where we have people come in, like this fine gentleman here, to teach you how to do something. Okay, so today we have Dr. Tristan Raich, who is a postdoc in the Biomedical Engineering Department, and he's going to talk to us about effectively communicating your data with pictures and numbers. Okay? Yeah? Thank you. Um, I think that's the first time I've been introduced as doctor, which is pretty cool. So, <laughs> keep your eyes on the prize, guys. There you go. So, thank you all very much uh, for coming. Thanks very much to the Postdoc Association, uh, the Wright Center, and the Library for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, if you've been following the How To Talks by Postdocs uh, series, it's been really great. You've probably gotten some really good information on how to uh, generate and assemble various pieces of data, uh, different assays you can run, different uh, tools you can use. And what I'm going to do today is to show you how to put it all together and effectively communicate your data. My pointer would like to work. So, are we not going? Moving on the side? Okay. Hey, all right. <laughs> Moving on. Onward and upward. Here. So. I'm actually going to interrupt you for just a second just to turn this off because later when you're watching the video, that starts to annoy you. Or it annoys me after like minute 10. How to present your data. Be annoyed by the thing in the corner. Step one. <laughs> all right. So, moving on. Why do we do what we do? As scientists, what's the point of all this hard work that we're doing? Well, it's to make a point, it's to make an argument. Uh, as you go through your scientific career, uh, you're going to want to publish in high impact journals, you're going to want your work to inform healthcare decisions or policy decisions, and whether you're uh, presenting data on uh, the causes or impacts of climate change, or you want to show a link between cigarettes and lung cancer. Uh, Whatever it is, your data should help you make an argument and make a point. And as a reviewer, as an audience member, uh, these tools I'm going to describe to you today should help you uh, evaluate other people's work. So there's kind of two sides to this. I'm going to be going through this as if we are the ones generating and presenting the data. But I want you to keep, for you to keep in mind uh, as we go along that whenever you come across a talk, a manuscript, a poster, uh, use these tools to evaluate that work and to critique it and to be uh, a really good part of the scientific community. So where did this all come from? Well, we as humans have been uh, describing our ideas and observations about the world around us since before we were technically humans. Uh, and then throughout the millennia, throughout the centuries, uh, we started to refine these ideas. And the first scientific journal started popping up in about the mid-1600s. And through the day where we have all of these digital tools for generating and presenting a huge amount of data. And this presentation can take a number of different forms from peer-reviewed journals to poster presentations to oral presentations uh, to even informational pamphlets. And regardless of the medium used, the goal is, is the same. is again, to present a point, to make an argument, to convince people with your data that what you have seen is some part of reality. But throughout uh, our scientific training, uh, we typically focus most on presenting our pretty pictures and look at all the great work I've done and no one really goes into a lot of the nitty gritty of how the proverbial sausage is made. Uh, probably, especially not outside of your specific lab, you might have a specific way of doing things uh, and that's pretty much all you're exposed to. So my goal here is to expose you to something maybe a little bit different, maybe a little bit more in depth and really give you five steps to presenting clear, compelling data. Number one, we're gonna start with answering a relevant, or asking, the question. Uh, you're going to hear me say this probably about 50 times over the course of this talk because it is so important. The question you ask is going to guide every single step, every single decision you make from here on out. Uh, you're going to need to find a method to answer that question that fits your specific application. Assemble your data in a way that makes sense to you. Uh, and appropriately apply statistics to make relevant and compelling comparisons. And finally, to present your results as clearly as possible. All this stuff is great, it makes a lot of sense until if you get to this last step, you fail in actually presenting in a compelling and uh, forthcoming way. 
Uh, in particular, I'm going to go through how to put together uh, your data for a talk or a poster, since those are two of the most common mediums for uh, people in this group, most likely. And I want you to keep in mind, as we go through this, the whole goal is to reduce some parameter of a population down to a single value. You're taking some big idea, and you're presenting a piece of data that basically represents that big idea in a single or just a couple of points. So first, we've got to start by asking the question. This is the most critical part of the process because, again, this question will guide your entire decision-making process, in some cases over the course of years. And it's really important that you don't lose sight of this question. As a certain Roman uh, philosopher Seneca once said, if, if one does not understand to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable. For us, um, this typically applies to, uh, it's really hard to design or interpret an experiment if you don't really know what question you're trying to answer, if you just are told, oh, run this experiment, do this assay, do this thing, and tell me the results. Well, if you take that and you say, okay, I'm going to go do this, well, you really have no basis to make any comparisons, draw any conclusions, and you certainly can't make a strong point if you don't know why you're doing that, what question you're asking. Once you ask, ask the overall question, there are going to be secondary questions, secondary problems that you need to solve or answer in order to answer that overall question. We're going to go through how we do this. So first off, again, you need to ask that question. So logically, you might wonder, how do you ask that question? There are generally two schools of thought in generating this overall question. And the first is to start from a preconceived notion or a testable hypothesis. For example, you might observe that in this population, x occurs more often than y. So you might say, I think that more people are born with brown eyes than with blue eyes. So you can go out, grab a bunch of people, look at their eyes, and we can test that hypothesis. The second is a descriptive or a discovery approach, in which you make an observation that, oh, we see x quite often in y population, so x must apply to all y. It's not really a strong testable hypothesis. It's more of, I think there's some difference here, and let's try to tease out some of these differences. For example, we only ever see female calico cats, so therefore all, all calico cats are female. This actually happens to be true, and got some really interesting things about genetics and fur color. Uh, quick note for all of us in this room, we're probably going to want to, uh, we might want to start with some descriptive or discovery approach in the early, early stages, saying, hey, what differences might be out there? But in terms of actually framing your study, designing your specific study, say you're a grad student designing your thesis project, you're going to want to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, approach this from the idea of a preconceived question or a testable hypothesis. In particular, for example, uh, funding agencies such as the NSF and the NIH, they're much more interested in supporting studies based on testable hypotheses than they are in so-called fishing expeditions. So make sure as you're designing your study, you have a clear question, you're not fishing for some difference, but that you frame it as a testable hypothesis that's clear and will inform the rest of your decision making. Either way, you're going to begin with observation. You need to make some observations that will inform this hypothesis. As you do this, you're going to want to consider your experimental model. Uh, this can be an iterative process where your tools that you have available to you are going to inform the kind of questions you want to ask. And the kind of question you're asking is going to dictate what sort of tools you need to answer that question. So early days, you're going to want to decide, am I looking at a group of humans that I'm going to ask them to answer survey questions? Am I going to use a cell line? Am I going to use an animal model? And then from there, you can start designing uh, your study. You're thinking about kind of the experiments you want to run, say, on a cell line, and so on and so forth. Again, this is an iterative process, and it's worth taking some time to really hone in on what resources you'll have available to you as you design your study so you don't bite off more than you can chew and that you actually deliver on testing your hypothesis. So let's get into an example from my current lab. Uh, one of our grad students, Brooke, she was interested in how endothelial cells, those are the cells lining your blood vessels, are affected by fluid flow. And the answer to this question could impact our understanding of cardiovascular disease, uh, progression, and treatment. So it's really important to understand how do these cells respond to the forces applied to them by the fluid. Well, she had this problem, and she needed to replicate endothelial cell response to fluid flow. Uh, I'm going to guess that people in this room probably wouldn't be super stoked about people just taking your blood vessels and testing them out and seeing what happens. 
So we need some sort of model. Well, that could be a cell line, that could be an animal model, and you, know, you get into some IACA things and some other problems that might not be appropriate for an early stage graduate student. So what she did is she went out and found a commercially available product in which she can seed some cells in this little channel here on the right, hook it up to a pump, and thereby replicate some of those fluid flow forces across her cells. This is a good starting point for someone in her position as a first year, second year grad student. So now we have our overall question, how are endothelial cells affected by fluid flow? We have a tool for answering this question. Now we need to generate our testable hypothesis, the hypothesis that will drive the rest of our study. We're going to make some observations. First, we know that under certain conditions, cells can respond differently to flow. Uh, they might change, for example, their shape or their orientation, but cells generally can sense the forces around them and they can respond. So we know that. Next, we know that the nucleus can act as the anchor of the cells. A lot of the structural fibers that run through the cell, uh, that give it its shape, its structure, are going through and might even be anchored to the nucleus. So the nucleus is an important structural component of the overall structure and shape of the cell. Number three, we can change the stiffness of the nucleus, make it stiff, softer or stiffer, with certain interventions, with certain drugs. So working backwards, we can change the stiffness of the nucleus, which is a structural component of the cell, and that structure can change based on flow. So that leads us to our testable hypothesis that nuclear stiffness can modulate cell response to fluid flow. Basically, I think observation three can have a direct impact on observation one based on this second you know, intermediate step here of observation two. So we have some observations that lead to our hypothesis, and now it's time to test that hypothesis. So again, we have an uh, overall uh, environment, a tool for uh, setting up our experiments, but now we need to get a little bit more specific about the methods that we'll use to test our hypothesis. Starting off, uh, you're going to want to be familiar in your field, maybe in your lab, uh, in kind of your research environment, what tools and uh, what sort of experiments are available to you, are expected, are kind of standard within the environment in which you're working. Uh, for example, a western block can commonly be shown to show how much of a certain protein is within a sample. Uh, we might use confocal microscopy to show where within a cell or a sample these pro proteins are located. In my field, cardiac electrophysiology, uh, we might use an EKG or an optical map of the heart to assess overall cardiac electrical function and cardiac health. And all of these different uh, experiments are going to have expected ways that uh, you'll need to summarize the important parameters of that point. So, in our case, what standard methods can we use? Well, we're looking at the structure of the cell. I want to be able to visualize structural components of each cell. For that, we're going to use some immunofluorescence. A lot of you might be familiar with this already, where we take a primary antibody, bind it to the protein of interest, and then we can tag it with a secondary antibody, complete with a specific fluorophore, and that'll basically light up wherever this protein is. Since we're looking at actin fibers, these are the structural actin components of the cell. Uh, good news for us is that there's already a bunch of actin-specific antibodies that we can use to tag our fluorophores to. And then we can put it into a confocal micros microscope and generate high-resolution images to see where these actin fibers are going, what they're looking like after we subject them to various flow conditions. The result is a few hundred images that look just like this. So this is great, these are very pretty, we've got our actin fibers in red, we've got our nucleus in blue, and so far we're looking pretty good. Uh, already, you might be able to see that there are some differences between conditions 1 and 2, just with your eyes with no quantification. Can anybody tell me what difference they think they see between condition 1 and condition 2? I need participating, guys. Yeah. Some el elongation of the cells. Yeah, exactly. So, what we're seeing is that on the bottom here, I've already shown that, or I've shown you that we're subjecting these cells to fluid flow from left to right. And what we're seeing is on the right, these cells look like they're elongating or kind of orienting themselves in that direction going from left to right. But now we need to find a way to quantify this, to put in numbers what we can see with our eyes. And this is a really tricky part of a lot of what we do in science, is we can see a difference. And now I need to be able to convince somebody else that this difference is real, is happening, without showing them 300 images. 
So how do we do that? Well, there are some uh, gener there have been some methods that people have used to look at act in alignment or fiber orientation, things like that. But there's not really anything that's as hard and fast as universally accepted as, say, a Western blot is. So what can we do? What if there are no standard, agreed upon, accepted methods for answering our question? Maybe you're asking a question that has never been answered before. Maybe the available resources aren't quite appropriate for what you're doing. They don't quite answer the question that you're asking. Well, this is where the creativity and the critical thinking of the scientists can really shine. Because it is absolutely appropriate for you to create your own method. And this is, in fact, a lot of what I do uh, as a grad student and now as a postdoc is image processing. So this is a little bit of a bonus section for you guys, a specific how-to. Uh, do some image processing. And something that you want to keep in mind, uh, whether you're doing some image processing or some other type of experiment, is that you're not alone in what you're trying to do. Um, modern science is highly collaborative. So even within this institution, you're going to have engineers, you're going to have other scientists looking to collaborate, you're going to have software available to you, you're going to have computer scientists that can help you use it. And the thing I want you to take away from this is that modern science is very much a team sport. The idea that you know the singular scientists with their giant brain and their own genius can drive an idea forward, that is dead and buried a long time ago. Use the resources around you, use the people around you in your own lab and other labs across the country, across the world even. There's a lot of great resources available to you. So you want to answer some of these questions on your own and you want to know how do I get started in image processing in particular? Well, ImageJ is a great resource. It's open source, that means free. Uh, and there's a huge community uh, detailing a bunch of tutorials and a lot of discussion about how to use some of the great features in ImageJ. In recent years, there's been a big push in science towards high throughput uh, repeatable methods that kind of take the human element out of the data analysis process and also allow you to generate a lot of data throughout repeated experiments, which is going to be really important. We'll get into this a little bit later to appropriately powering your studies. So, if that's something you're interested in, you might want to develop some coding skills or find somebody who has, and maybe write a program in MATLAB or Python, for example, to get through a whole bunch of images and give you repeatable, quantifiable results. So this is the direction I'm going to go. Uh, as we remember, working from our hypothesis that nuclear stiffness modulates cell response to fluid flow, I'm most interested in quantifying this cell response. So this is where we're going to start. Excuse me. So whatever information I pull out of my images needs to give me some idea of what's happening to the cell response. So if I start with one of my actin images, I can tell this is basically just a bunch of stripes going up and down the image, left to right, up and down, wherever. And I want to know how can I quantify where these stripes or lines are going. Well, I go to the Google machine, and this is how my sausage is made. This is what I do for just about any image processing issue that I get stuck on. I Google the program I'm working in, in this case MATLAB, and what I want to do, in this case edge detection. And MATLAB just so happens to have a built-in function called edge. And on their MathWorks site, they have all kinds of documentation about how to use the syntax and how to uh, put in the right inputs and which outputs you can expect and all that great stuff. So I'm going to run my program through an edge detection algorithm built into MATLAB. And what I get when I zoom in is that Looks like we've found a whole bunch of little lines. This is great. We have some lines. Awesome. Now what do I do? Now I want to see where are these lines, how big are they, where are they pointing, and happily, uh, MATLAB has another built-in function called region props, where it will uh, essentially model every structure it identifies within an image as an ellipse with a centroid and a major axis. And it will tell me how long this major axis is, uh, its orientation, where it's located, and I can then use this information to draw some conclusions about my actin fibers. No matter what you're doing, it's really important that you don't just take the number at face value, but you understand what exactly is going on under the hood, so to speak, so you know exactly what you're quantifying. I am quantifying how MATLAB, A, detects the edge of any structure within this image, and then B, the shape, size, and orientation of that shape that it detected before. And what's our result? Well, we end up with a whole bunch of lines. And this looks like a mess, it looks like a jumble, but really all it is is a bunch of lines. And now 
I have a bunch of information about my lines, and I can use that information to make some uh, comparisons between my experimental groups. So if we go back to our two images, which we noted before, one looks to be elongated or aligned in a certain direction compared to the other. Well, we'll apply our edge detection program. And we can see it isn't perfect, but it gives us a pretty good representation of where these fibers are pointing. Uh, these lines line up pretty well, pretty reasonably, with where those actin fibers are in the image. This is great. Let's see if it happens the same in image two. You can see, again, not perfect, but a pretty good representation of where those fibers are. And that relationship that we saw before of one looking more horizontally aligned than the other appears to be conserved once we get through this image processing uh, program. So, great. Now we need to actually look at our results. What do our results mean? Again, don't just take the number at face value. You need to understand what exactly it is that you're quantifying. So again, we're looking at actin alignment under flow. And it's quite convenient that uh, the left to right direction of our flow just happens to line up with the horizontal or zero degree uh, line in MATLAB. And so what I can say is that fibers that are horizontally aligned left to right will probably be more, will probably be closer to zero than fibers that are randomly distributed, which if you randomly distribute a bunch of fibers from zero to 90 degrees, those should average out close to about 45 degrees. Let's see how close our assumption is to reality. Well, we need our condition one and our condition two. And what we see is that in condition one, where we don't really see any particular alignment, uh, those fiber orientation uh, numbers average out to about 36 degrees, fairly close to 45. While in our aligned image, that averages out closer to about 15 degrees. So it's closer to zero than our, quote, unaligned image. So already we're seeing the numbers are backing up what we saw in our head. But we saw with our own eyes that our brain processed and said that one looks more aligned than the other one. It's also really important to know that uh, in practice, the result will differ from in theory. And what we're seeing here, uh, when I ran this on a few other images, uh, and using a couple of different positive controls, that while the unaligned images seem to hang around that 45 degree uh, mark, the ones that were even most perfectly aligned never really got below about 15 degrees. And I realized that this is because of just how that edge detection program works. If there's gonna be a lot of pixels in there in that image that are more vertical. And that's not really something I can clean up or get through without doing a lot of other uh, intervention that might skew my results. So I'm just gonna have to keep in mind that even my most perfectly aligned images are probably gonna be around that 15 degree line. If I can get to about 15 degrees, I can probably say these are aligned. So just keep in mind as you're going through interpreting your, re your results to keep in mind that what it's supposed to do in theory may not always line up with how those results appear in practice. So we end up with a huge spreadsheet after doing this about 300 more times. And now I need to make some decisions about how I want to arrange my data to answer my questions, to test my hypothesis. I can start with my average action orientation, as we just went through, to kind of tell me what direction these fibers are pointing. Uh, I can look at the standard deviation of that uh, actin orientation, and maybe I can see what's the variability between images. Maybe uh, one intervention causes a lot more variability within the same image than another one. I can look at the number of fibers. Maybe one of my intervention kills all of my cells. Maybe they change the number or the length of these fibers. That might be good information to have. I'm going to go back uh, to this average orientation because I think that's a pretty good representation of the question that I want to answer, which has to do with whether these fibers are aligned or not. Going back to my hypothesis, again, that flow conditions and nuclear spinness modulate that cell response. So now we need to assemble our data in a way that makes sense and can help us actually draw some conclusions and make some comparisons. Yet again, what is my overall question? I'm interested in how epithelial cells are, or endothelial cells, excuse me, are affected by fluid flow, testing the hypothesis that nuclear stiffness modulates cell response. I put my cells into our pump. I subjected them to one of three flow conditions, that's the static, laminar, that's unidirectional, steady state, or oscillatory, just swishing them back and forth, for either one or three days. I then uh, added either TSA, which softens the nucleus, or methylstat, which stiffens the nucleus. And again, 
I want to see which combination of all the all of these factors impacts how the cells align in the direction of flow. So to assemble our data, the biggest point is to be clear about what question you're asking and what question you're answering. And make sure those are the same question or you're going to get yourself in trouble. So again, our overall question is how do cells respond to fluid flow and can this response change based on another intervention? I think that nuclear stiffness should modulate the cell response to fluid flow and I need to arrange this data in a way that's most compelling and best answers that question. As I mentioned, our cell response is going to be quantified by the orientation mean, or the average orientation of those fibers. And now I need to decide whether I want to arrange my data by flow and time, or by intervention, to best capture that nuclear stiffness information. Now I'm going to, well, pivot uh, to pivot tables, real quick. Uh, I want to give you guys uh, a really good tool to quickly and easily organize your data. Uh, anybody that's tried to wrangle a giant, messy spreadsheet I'll probably tell you how big of a nightmare this can be if you don't plan it out well from the beginning. Uh, using a pivot table, you can take your giant spreadsheet and quickly and easily and efficiently organize it into ways that make sense. Um, since this will be uh, recorded and archived, on the screen here I'm going to leave a link to a really good uh, pivot table uh, tutorial just to get you started, or you can Google that same phrase and you'll probably end up pretty good. <coughs> And then also, I don't know why Excel uh, sets up their defaults the way that they do, but if you go through just setting up your pivot table and it looks really weird, here are some settings that I've used to get this result here on the right, and it just sets things up nice and easy so I can organize everything uh, specifically how I want to. So pivot tables are awesome. Uh, everything I go off of here will be from a pivot table, and this is really where it came from. This is a really powerful tool that you can use uh, to organize your data, especially as you get into huge, huge data sets, which will probably happen to you over the course of the next couple of years. So now I have my pivot table, everything's already organized, and some of these numbers, even now, look like they're different from each other. But you can't just throw a table into a paper or a talk and call it a day. This isn't all that visually striking, this isn't visually appealing. I've assemble my data in a way that makes sense and I can start to see some differences and maybe make some comparisons, but who cares? Nobody, nobody's going to stop in a poster session to look at a tape. It doesn't work that way. So we need to visually assemble our data to answer our overall question and to make that intuitive to our viewers. So we're going to start just in Excel uh, with a pretty basic bar graph. And I can answer my overall question, how do cells respond to fluid flow, just by having uh, again, this quantification of actin alignment, and I can even draw a line at 45 degrees, and I can say, hey, under control conditions at 24 hours, these cells look like they're aligned uh, pretty much as we expect them to. We have a, a random distribution uh, from 0 to 90 degrees that averages out to about 45, and our data backs that up. At 72 hours, though, uh, those cells align closer to about 15 degrees. So this is getting closer to that point where we can say from our analysis, yeah, they're pretty much aligned left to right in the direction of flow. But then what if I want to ask a secondary question? Can this response change based on another intervention? Well, if I add my TSA data here on the right, uh, I can see that there seems to be some difference even at 24 hours between control and TSA. I can do the same thing with methylstat, and I can see now, that 72 hours, there seems to be maybe some difference uh, between my methylstat uh, group and the control. But my question to you is, is there a better way that I could present these data to compare between conditions? What do you guys think I could do to make this comparison more obvious? <clears throat> and to look at the arrows, what do you guys think I could do? Well, one easy way is I can just put the bars next to each other. The way you assemble your data will make the comparison that the audience expects more intuitive. So here's the exact same data on the right, and the only difference is that I changed my bars. I changed where they are. So right now, my control in blue and my, and my TSA in black are right next to each other. At 24 hours, I can see much more readily what that difference is. And I can see that 72 hours, hey, that change persists through 72 hours, and they look about the same after a few days. 
If I do the same thing with Methostat, I can see that that difference that I had seen with TSA is gone. My uh, Methostat cells look about the same as my control ones. And then that uh, cell alignment under control conditions is attenuated at 72 hours. So these cells aren't aligning as quickly as they normally would when their nuclei is stiffer. So I'm done, right? Am I missing anything? Who thinks I'm missing something? What do you think I'm missing? I have no idea. It just sounds like you want me to say yes. Yes, I do want you to say yes. I want an answer because this is getting awkward. No. All right. So what I'm missing is some objective, some quantitative comparison between my conditions. I want to be able to say definitively, or as definitively as I can, which conditions are different from each other. And you may have guessed that, yes, this is where we get into statistics. So I like statistics. I'm a bit of a nerd. This is kind of fun. This uh, section of the uh, presentation will be woefully inadequate in your understanding of statistics. I'm assuming most people, if not everybody in this room, has taken a stats class in some form or another. Uh, so hopefully this will kind of get you at least pointed in the right direction, uh, get you on the right path, and give you some resources to continue on your statistical journey. So why are statistics so critical? Well, they allow you to summarize a population within a single value. They give you an aggregate of your data, which you can then use to make comparisons between different groups. <clears throat> so long as you choose an appropriate test. And this can be a bit of a nightmare because you have to consider how many data sets you have, how many variables, whether they're, those data are normally distributed or not, whether the variance is the same, and it can be a bit of a nightmare. Uh, in general, some tests that I just keep in the back of my mind, my go-tos uh, to start off, are t-test when I want to compare two means, an ANOVA or analysis of variance when I want to compare several groups simultaneously, or a chi-squared if I want to look at uh, the, uh, the difference between observed and expected occurrence. Basically, if something happens 60% of the time, is that different from expecting it to happen 40% of the time? That's a chi-squared. <coughs> so which test you're going to uh, use is going to depend on which comparisons you want to make. So the first test, the first decision you're going to make, based on your original question, is which comparison to make. So I can go pair by pair. Maybe I want to look at the difference between control and TSA at 24 hours. Maybe I want to look at all four conditions simultaneously. But then, you know, I think that you know, 24 hours of TSA and 72 hours of control. That's a lot of variables going on at once. I'm not really interested in that comparison, so I'm not going to make that comparison. I think the most interesting comparison is just going pair by pair. I want to see what happens at 24 hours between control and TSA. So I'm going to use an unpaired two-tailed t-test. With all statistical tests, pretty much, you're going to begin with a null hypothesis that these two means are the same. <clears throat> and you're going to obtain a p-value. Basically, you, uh, a lot of you have probably heard this before. You're going to run your test. You're going to put it into Excel or your program, and you're going to spit out a number that hopefully is very small. And what this actually is, is the probability of obtaining a result as or more extreme as the one that you found. And how do we know what the cutoff is? How do you know whether that actually means anything? Well, then we need to know our alpha, or our critical value. Because you're going to uh, generate a t, t value or a t statistic, or more likely a computer will do that for you. And that will fall somewhere on the normal distribution of t statistics. And that alpha or critical value will basically be the cutoff to say that Yes, this t statistic is extreme enough that you can be pretty confident you didn't just stumble into finding it by chance. So that's our alpha. That's what we're looking for. We're trying to get a p-value less than, or maybe you actually want one greater than, 0 0.05. This will give you a tool to make your comparisons. So here's some resources that I found to be pretty useful. Uh, you might want to use software such as Prism, which you may or may not have access to. Uh, here at VCU on the VCU software site, you have access to Jump and SPSS, which are very powerful statistical tools that can help you generate some cool figures and make a whole bunch of different uh, tests pretty uh, easily and pretty straightforward. R is an open source programming platform uh, that has a bunch of really great software packages and tutorials and documentation from the community to do a bunch of great statistics. I use R a lot in my statistics. I do a lot of linear regressions, for example, in R. Uh, and even Excel. Excel has a lot of great built-in functions, especially if you use the data analysis tool pack, which is 
Uh, you can just go to the options, Google Data Analysis Tool Deck and Excel, and you'll be good. Uh, here at BCU, we also have a bunch of classes that undergrads and graduates can take. Um, these come highly recommended, particularly STAT 441 and its uh, graduate counterpart 543. Uh, from people who have taken those classes, going through which tests to use, how to execute it, how to interpret those results, all that great stuff uh, is taught in these classes. If you have a slot available for a class, maybe you're already required to take a STATS class, highly recommend that you take one so that it, that will make you a better scientist when it comes to executing your experiment and making your comparisons. So now it's time to make our comparisons, and I'm just going to use Excel. I'm going to use a pretty basic t-test function, so I'm going to say I want to do a t-test. I'm going to select the excuse me, uh, groups that I want to compare. I'm going to say I want to do a two-tailed distribution and a two-tailed sample with unequal variance. Basically, I see the error bars uh, between my control and TSA group at 24 hours, and they're different. So that tells me I'm probably using unequal variance. And my result is a p-value that's very small. In fact, it's a couple of orders of magnitude below 0 0.05. So, hooray, we can reject the null hypothesis and state that there is a statistically significant difference between these two means. Now, here's where I need to let you all know that I cheated. A couple of you probably know how I cheated, but in case uh, you aren't quite sure, these two populations are not uh, independent samples. In fact, they are replicates within the same sample. Who here has ever heard of the difference between a sample and a replicate? Both hands. Right, there's like four. Cool. So one thing that's really tricky in science is that we as scientists are kind of terrible about describing what exactly is an independent sample and what is a replicate within that sample. So in this context, all of these values come from images of the same dish. So each dish, each run of the experiment can be considered an independent sample. And based on what comparisons you're trying to make, your field, uh, the exact experiment, what exactly is an independent sample and how many replicates within that sample is going to change. Um, but something that I really want you guys to keep in mind is what is my N? What are my independent samples? Can anybody here give me an example from your lab about what is an independent sample versus what's a replicate in the context of your experiments? Yes. So I would say if you were looking at like the spinal cord in mice, right, mm -hmm. then each individual mouse would be a sample, but different sections within that spinal cord would be a replicate of one mouse. Yeah, yeah that's great. So within each mouse, each mouse might be different, but then where in the spinal cord, say certain proteins are expressed or certain uh, you know, like physiological functions are happening, might also be different. But overall, you want to say, if I have this intervention or this injury, how does that affect a mouse? So a mouse is then my independent sample, and a replicate can give me some information about how my uh, interventions, how my experiments are being quantified within my sample. So that's a lot of information. It's a really complex subject that we as scientists don't have a great answer to. But please keep that in mind because reviewers love to tear apart your statistics in review and say you don't have enough independent samples, you just have replicates, do it again. So keep that in mind from the beginning and it'll make your life a lot easier. So now we're done, right? Well, no. Once you actually execute your statistical test, you then need to interpret that test. Keep in mind that statistics are not the end all be all. You don't just get a p value and call it a day. Statistics are a tool that you can use to make some quantitative comparisons between groups. So again, double check your comparison, make sure you're making A, an appropriate comparison to answer your question, and B, that that's a relevant or interesting comparison. Not every relationship is gonna be interesting and worthy of being quantified. You wanna spend your statistical power where it's gonna get you the best result. Know your alpha. Do you need to change it for multiple comparisons? Excuse me. Uh, is that 0 0.05 a hard and fast cutoff? As scientists, we're typically trained to treat that 0 0.05 as black and white. If it's below this line, it's good. If it's above this line, it's not. Out of curiosity, show of hands, if you design an experiment, you execute it, you feel really good about your data, and you run your test, and you get a p-value of 0 0.053, who here, show of hands, would feel comfortable publishing that in a peer-reviewed journal for publication? I see two. And a half. 
Well, I don't understand the question. I mean, no. just because you don't get a significant result doesn't yeah. mean it shouldn't be published. I mean, regardless of whether that's 0.05 or 0.25. I love that answer. That is the best answer. I did not expect to get such a good answer. Thank you. So mathematically, there's really no difference between 0.47 and 0 .5, 0 0.053. 0 0.047, 0 0.053. But we as scientists tend to shy away from, oh man, like, Maybe I need to increase my sample size, or I need to do something different, and we get really skittish about what this actually means. But as a scientist, you need to be able to interpret your results. This is a probability that you found your results by chance. Whether that's 5.3% or 4.7%, there's really no difference there. And you should be able to feel confident in justifying and explaining the result you found and why you think that can still be considered significant. Or, Maybe you do need to increase your statistical power. This is another uh, concept I want to go over is statistical power versus p-hacking. If you run a uh, power analysis, which I strongly recommend you do as early as you can, you might say that, well, I did this three times, but really I need four or six or eight independent samples to observe a difference. But then if you did this maybe a thousand times when you only needed five samples, that's called p-hacking. And that's a phenomenon where you can mathematically quantify a statistically significant difference between groups with just a minuscule, infinitesimally small difference between those groups. So again, as scientists, we need to know that these statistics are not the end-all be-all. That they're a tool that we need to critique and we need to be aware of what they're actually telling us. So as you run your statistics, whether you're an investigator or as a reviewer or an audience member, keep in mind this relationship may or may not be statistically significant, but what's the effect size? Is this meaningful? Is this comparison, is this difference actually affecting the end goal of the study? Are you actually giving me anything that's relevant and useful uh, for me to go forward with? Next, you need to check any assumptions that you made when you ran your test. For example, we use a t-test, so that assumes that we have normally distributed data. So here's some of our data, and I can see that in this case, yeah, this stuff is normally distributed. These data are roughly normally distributed. A t-test seems like it'd be appropriate in this case. But here's my control data. This data is not normally distributed, and that's a problem. That means I should either increase my sample size because a normal distribution assumes a relatively large sample size, or I need to choose a different test. I cannot use a t-test if my data is not normally distributed. So after you've done your statistical analysis, or even before, it's a good idea to go through and double check the assumptions that you need to be able to make in order to use that test. Finally, identify outliers or causes of high variability. Now, as scientists, it's really, really tempting to see outliers and just sort of write them off. Think, oh, that was just a weird one. That little guy, don't worry about that little guy. We're just going to ignore that. Outliers can never be excluded just because they make your numbers tricky or hard to deal with but they can inform you about maybe a section of your study that was poorly designed or poorly executed, and maybe something that you need to go back and redo or retry, or they could be an indication of something that happens with low probability but is a real effect of your intervention. Maybe you need to increase your sample size to better capture that real effect. So keep in mind, whenever you see high variability, that that's another tool that you can use to further evaluate either your work or the work that you're being exposed to. Next, consider that significant has a specific statistical meaning. This is one of my biggest pet peeves, even though we as scientists need to be careful of all of our word choices, but I'm giving the talk so I get to talk about significant. Uh, any Mythbusters fans may recognize this scene from an early episode where Adam is sitting on an airplane toilet, which is pulling a vacuum on his behind. He giggles uncontrollably, and the only words he can get out over and over again is, that's significant. We as English speakers tend to abuse our own language, and we tend to use the word significant instead of substantial or a lot or a great deal. But just keep in mind, in this case, don't be like Adam, and know that if you use the word significant, that has a very specific statistical meaning and should be backed up by a valid statistical test anytime you use the word significant. So we've done all this work. We've made our hypothesis. We've gotten a good method to test it. We've assembled our data, we've ran our statistics, and now it's time to tell the world about all the great work that we've done. It's time to present. So the number one thing to keep in mind when you're presenting your data is that clarity is king. 
You can have the prettiest figures in the world, the greatest analysis, and if the audience can't follow your point, then it's pretty useless. One of the biggest tips I give to junior trainees, you know, some early grad students, some, even some people in my position who are postdocs, is to resist the urge to data dump. This was one of my biggest problems when I was giving some of my first committee meetings back in my grad school days, is that I was so, uh, you know, I felt so pressured to deliver all of the stuff I've done. I've done so much stuff. Look at all the stuff I've done. I've done all this great work, and this is really great, and it's going to be an awesome paper. And that's a lovely way to completely muddy the proverbial waters and get your audience to absolutely pick apart your study. Instead, what you should focus on is telling a story that is succinct and focused. And you can add detail later on as needed. Maybe if, when you submit for a publication, a reviewer will ask for more supplementary material or a better explanation of your method or your quantification. Uh, if you're giving a poster, someone might stop you and say, oh, hey, wait, what about that figure right there? How did you get that? Be prepared to give more data, but don't overload your audience with a whole bunch of data right off the bat. Finally, you and your audience should draw the same conclusion. If you get to the end of your presentation, and you and your audience are arguing, like our little stick friend here, about what is a coincidence and what is not, you have probably gone wrong somewhere along the line in actually presenting your data and making a clear argument. One way that we can present our data and make this argument is with representative images. Just like with statistics, representative images will allow you to represent a population within a single point. Because nobody has the time to go through 300 images and decide if there is a difference between group A and group B. So instead, you summarize everything in your representative images. These images should accompany their graphical or statistical representations, and they should allow the audience to draw a qualitative message, while the statistics and the quantification convey a quantitative message. Your audience should get the gist of what you're trying to say just by looking at those two images, or however many you have. Now, where do these pretty pictures come from? Well, most of mine start off in Excel. Excel, you can create some great graphs, you can label them, you can do everything you need to do. And for most presentations and you know, anything like a committee meeting, lab meeting, I'll usually just go in Excel, make a chart, put it up there, label it appropriately, call it a day. Sometimes you'll need to go a step further. Uh, if I'm presenting a talk at a national conference, or maybe I'm putting together a paper for peer review, I'll use uh, Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop to spruce up my images, make them a little bit clearer, make them a little bit more polished looking so that I can more clearly convey my message. For example, here's an image, a figure that I uh, put in a publication which we got accepted last year, and I used Illustrator to add some shading, to add some labels, to make my graphs stand out a little bit more. And even if these resources aren't available to you, if all fails, you can use Paint or PowerPoint to assemble your images and to add some needed detail. So don't feel like if you don't have access to Photoshop that you're up a creek and you can't make your images. Even in PowerPoint, you can do some pretty powerful things and get your message across very clearly. I want to give you some representative images, do's and don'ts now. It is absolutely okay to cherry pick your representative images. These don't have to actually be the representation of the average or the normal if that's not going to actually convey your message. While the statistics provide the objective support, your image should convey an intuitive message to the audience. So long as your image is actually from the data set from which you're pulling, uh, it is absolutely okay to use that image, even if it doesn't perfectly represent the population as a whole. It should just say, A is different from B, and choose your images accordingly to make that clear. You can manipulate your images for clarity or emphasis. You can change the brightness or the contrast, you can add arrows or circles or highlights. Just be clear about what you've done, tell the audience. That's probably a good time to let you know that I have changed all of my acting images. I've upped the brightness and contrast to make that show up better on screen. But I did that after my analysis. Make sure that all of your analytical uh, process is done consistently, and then you can manipulate your images to make that more clear so long as it doesn't change the fundamental process of how the audience uh, perceives it, but that uh, that point is made more clear. No, do not crowd or over-explain your figures. Present the data that makes your point, nothing more and nothing less. And you want to do this kind of point by point. 
So don't feel like you need to cram everything into one figure with 12 panels, and all of this was done by the same experiment, so therefore it all needs to be included at once. You can break your figures up, you can break your data up into manageable pieces to make that point, and then go on to the next one, make that point clearly, go on to the next one. Excuse me. Furthermore, you want to avoid mismatch relationships. This can be as simple as a typo in a paper, uh, which I actually just figured we did last week. We got a, a review back and we got rejected. And part of that is because in figure six, we had one word in there that we thought we had deleted, but it was left in and it completely changed how our data was interpreted. Whether it's something like that or your images and graphs are not quite showing the same message, the thing you want to make sure you're doing is that every single piece of information in the same work and in the same figure all deliver the same message. They all make the same point. Finally, you never want to manipulate your images to influence results. For example, if brightness or contrast is the measured quantity, you want to make sure that that's consistent across all images. For confocal microscopy, this can be something like keeping the laser intensity, the digital gain, and the brightness and contrast all the same between all images as you quantify them, and then if you need to make things clear later on, then you can manipulate them after the uh, quantification is done. For example, here's a couple of images, and I could probably convince you that whatever I did to the one on the right had bigger impact than the one on the left. And some of you have probably already realized that they are the exact same image. I've just upped the brightness on the one on the right. And this might seem like an extreme example, but even in peer-reviewed publications, we see tricks like this pretty commonly, where people will up the brightness and say, look, we did this and this had this result, but it's pretty clear that you know they're digital gain wasn't exactly the same. Maybe their laser intensity was different on their microscope. Be very clear, be very careful about how you present your data, how you quantify your data, how you obtain your data, because your integrity as a scientist is on the line any time that you present. We as scientists need to be able to trust that other scientists are acting in good faith and that the data they present accurately depicts their results of the experiments as they were described. With that, we'll get on to specifically uh, labeling figures, which again is going to be critical for adding clarity. Uh, and the general thought is that figures should stand alone. The audience should be able to get the gist, the main point of your data, just by looking at the figure with no caption, with no abstract, without a whole block of text. They should pretty easily be able to intuit what you're trying to say. So let's go back to our normally distributed data from earlier. If anybody had walked in halfway through, maybe they were watching this on YouTube and just skip ahead, they might wonder, what the heck is he talking about? Where did this data come from? I don't know what's being quantified, or I don't know how it's being quantified. All of this just kind of seems to come out of nowhere. And again, this is an extreme example, but keep in mind, even if it's for something like a lab meeting or a committee meeting, something that junior trainees, like I was, forget all the time is that you are the only one who's familiar with your data and how you have assembled it. And you want to be clear about how your data is assembled and what comparisons you're making. Uh, I want you to contrast that with this graph, which uh, Brooke presented at Biomedical Engineering Society, where we have very clearly on the x-axis different time points. I know on my y-axis I'm quantifying active orientation. Even in black and white, my legend stands out pretty vividly that all right, my black is my control, my gray is TSA. I know which statistical comparisons I'm making just by looking at this graph for three seconds. So this is a well-labeled graph. I get all the relevant information I need without anything being redundant. It's clear, it's concise, it's focused, and I know what point we're trying to make just by looking at this graph. Then we get into the structure of data presentation. And something very clear we discussed earlier a few slides back with our bar graphs is that the structure will dictate which comparisons are made. Which comparisons do your audience expect you to make? This is going to start with your reference or your control. So always keep in mind, what's my reference? What am I comparing everything to? This is, again, typically going to be some kind of control. Now, as modern Western readers, we typically read left to right and top to bottom, and your control or your reference should be arranged accordingly. And then you want to use the physical space, the physical structure of your data to intuit which comparisons are going to be made. For example, when I soften the nucleus with TSA, I know on the left here with my images, I'm going to go left to right control to TSA. 
that structure is preserved in my graph. In my graph, on the same uh, spot, I know I'm going left to right, control to TSA. Same structure at the 24 hour, or at the 72 hour mark. Left to right, control TSA on the graph, left to right, control TSA. And I'm gonna keep this structure consistent on any subsequent slides in my talk or any other figures in my paper or my poster. So give the audience a clear structure and then use that structure to make your next observations, your next comparisons more obvious, more intuitive. And finally, anything that you don't want to compare should be spaced physically apart from each other. For example, again, my 24 hour control and my 72 hour TSA. I don't want to make that comparison. I'm going to put those pieces of data physically further apart so that, you know, as an audience member, I don't really care about making that comparison. So now we're going to try an example. Uh, I'm going to give you no information about this figure. I'm going to need a little bit of a hint in the slide title, but I want to know if we can figure out what data have been presented and what point the author is making. Just by these images and their graphical uh, support, what point is being made? I'm not giving you the manuscript title, I'm not giving you an abstract model, I'm not even giving you the figure legend. What point is being made by these authors? There's a difference. <laughs> yes. Can we society. tell where the difference is? Was that? No, I was, I was just joking with that. Like, we live in a society. We live in a society, okay? Just like something Definitely. very derogatory <laughs> and very bland. <laughs> yes. There's a smaller volume of white stuff on the figure furthest to the right compared to the figure just next to it. And they're, they're not trying to compare, but basically everything else is more or less the same. Exactly. Yeah, so this is an interstitial volume comparison. What these uh, people did, this is actually from a then grad student in my previous lab, is they took two different hearts, or two, two different uh, mouse strains, took out the hearts, perfused it with one of two different solutions, and then saw how the tissue responded to that perfusion. And what they noticed was that there was no difference between the solutions unless you first knocked out a gene in that particular heart, and then the solution actually mattered. That was the point they were trying to make. Next, possibly one that's slightly trickier, uh, <clears throat> is some action potential duration data. I'm a heart guy, if you haven't noticed, I like heart stuff, I think this is cool. And also, I want to see if any of you, possibly not heart people, can tell me, uh, again, what data have been presented, and what point the author is trying to make. You don't need to be an expert to answer the question, Thomas. Yes? The two lines at the bottom on the left-hand mm -hmm. graph are st statistically different. OK. Um, probably from the two lines above and possibly from each other. OK, great. Yeah. Um, what we're uh, showing here is three drugs. One of them, flecainide, is a sodium channel blocker. Two of them, penicidyl and RL3, are potassium channel blockers. We would expect a potassium channel blocker to shorten the active potential, which is exactly what we have seen, and that these two traces down here are shorter than the ones above them. The sodium channel blocker should have its own effects, but that should not affect action potential duration. And what this data can be used for is actually a really important determinant in which uh, treatment a doctor might select when determining, which, uh, determining how to treat different arrhythmogenic diseases. So that was fun. I'm glad you did that. It's great. <clears throat> Next, you want to tailor your data presentation to the medium used. For example, on a manuscript, you have a lot of text and in detail description about your methods and your data, so you can go into a good amount of detail of how you obtain your results and your rationale for doing your experiments. Excuse me. Uh, the main drawback is that they're going to be static. They can sometimes be uh, presented in black and white. And you, the investigator, the author, won't be standing next to the reader, most likely, to explain what's going on. Another common one for especially for the people in this room is going to be a poster. You're going to have a large area. You're going to have that typically broken up into distinct sections. And really, the big bonus here is that it's a more intimate setting between you and your audience member, where it's typically one and you know maybe one or two, maybe three other people who can interact and have this back and forth discussion as you go through the presentation. Contrast that with a talk, which is essentially a monologue of 10, 15, 60 minutes, exactly what I'm doing here, 
uh, where you can use animations to your advantage. You can guide your audience's attention and walk your audience through your data, and that really should be the main goal. But there isn't typically a whole lot of back and forth. It's basically me up here, I need to convince you of something, and I'm going to try to do so within the next 60 minutes. Finally, you can use video. Uh, this has the potential to be the most engaging medium because you can vividly animate and describe various points. But it can also be pretty tricky to pull off because, let's face it, nobody wants to sit and watch a video about graphs. So this can be a little bit tricky, but also can have, in certain applications, really good uh, potential for being an engaging medium for a wide audience. So for this audience, I'm going to talk uh, first about an oral presentation and kind of how uh, you can structure your data. Uh, an earlier presentation in this how-to series went for an hour into how to structure a presentation. So uh, for now, we're just going to talk about uh, the data itself and how you can structure your data. And I encourage you all to go back. And if you haven't already, watch that talk uh, to understand kind of how to fill in everything around your data, which I thought was really great. So the main goal is to make the narrative flow in a way that controls your audience's attention. Each figure, each panel, should logically raise more questions, which you should then answer in the next figure, panel, slide, however you go, culminating in making your overall point that you have answered your hypothesis, or tested your hypothesis. And this begins right off the bat with slide design. First, you're gonna start with a descriptive title. My rule of thumb is that any title you have, every title you have, should give a point of that slide. Somebody should be able, if they were just to write down your slide titles, get the main point of your talk. If somebody was to write down your slide titles, they should feel like they attended your talk and got the main points from what you're going. I'm then gonna typically split my slides uh, in half. I'm either gonna go from top to bottom or from left to right. I'm not gonna ask my audience to follow an entire block of white screen at the same time. <clears throat> I'm gonna get small pieces of information. What do I mean by that? If I was to just give you this uh, figure, which you've seen before, but if I was just giving a talk, and I say, oh, hey, we softened the nucleus, and this is what we saw, we saw this, we saw this, we saw this, one of three things is going to happen. Either the audience is going to listen to me and completely give up on focusing on the slide. They're going to ignore me, and they're going to try to figure out acting orientation, what's over there, what are these time points, controls over there, TSA, you know, what's happening. And they're probably going to miss some nuance, some detail that I'm trying to give. They're going to miss my delivery of this data. Or most likely, option three, they're going to zone out and start thinking about the next talk they're going to, what's for lunch, and you are going to completely lose the audience. Hopefully, you can get them back next slide. Let's talk about a better way that we can deliver our data to make sure that doesn't happen. So first, I start with a nice, strong, descriptive title. I'm saying that soft nuclei causes faster alignment under flow. I've only given you my control data. I know uh, my control 24 hour lines up with the graph on the right. And I know my images are going to go top to bottom, while my graphs are going to be read left to right. That structure makes some sense. My uh, reference is on the top and on the left. I can then say, well, at 24 hours, we treated them with TSA for that same time period, and we saw that the cells aligned much faster. Then that effect persisted through 72 hours. I've given you smaller pieces of data as we've gone along to make that point clear and make it easy to follow. And how did I do that? With some cleverly aligned white boxes and PowerPoint animations. You may have noticed I have been doing this this entire time for the past 45-ish minutes. All of my talk so far has just been giving you pieces of information using fairly simple PowerPoint animations to make everything uh, as straightforward as possible. I hope I've done that. And to make sure I don't overload you with any one massive dump of information at any one time. So once I've gone through this, I've hopefully convinced you that soft nuclei cause faster alignment under flow. The next logical question is, what happens if you stiffen the nucleus? And I'm glad you asked. Great question. Again, I'm going to start with my slide title, again, if somebody is only writing down my slide titles, they should get the gist of my talk. And in this case, stiff nuclei inhibit alignment under flow. I have the same exact structure of my data. My control is on the left, top to bottom, and on the right is the graph, left to right. Same structure as before. We added methyl stat. We make that comparison obvious that, oh, they're not different from control. And the alignment that we see with control is, in fact, attenuated 
with a stiffer nucleus. I've again given you a small piece of data as we go along, and I can continue on to my talk to make my point. <clears throat> Probably the most common uh, medium that people in this room will use is a poster. And these can be pretty intimidating uh, because, let's face it, nobody wants to stand in the same spot for two hours making awkward eye contact with strangers. But you can set yourself up for success or failure the instant you print your poster. Step one, know the size and orientation of the poster board. In the US, we typically see our posters arranged in a horizontal or a landscape orientation, and typically around three by four feet, maybe six by eight. Before you go, before you print your poster, before you begin designing your poster, know how big the poster board is, and know what orientation it's in, so that you can set it up appropriately. Uh, most of the time, this is going to lend itself to a three-section layout to be led left, to be read left to right and top to bottom. Uh, this is a really common way to organize your poster. Your lab might have a different way of doing things. A lot of people have some really interesting ideas about how to present data in posters, and I encourage you to look that up. But for a starting point, we can just start here and know that your most important data should be most prominent. This real estate in the middle of your poster is incredibly valuable because it's what's going to draw your audience's eyes. People are walking through your poster session. They're just going to be looking around and, oh, that's a cool picture. What's over there? Use this space wisely. Basically, don't put your method section smack dab in the middle. Nobody cares. Put your most compelling, most interesting looking bit of data, if you can, right in the middle. So again, just like with any slide or uh, talk title, begin with the descriptive title of your poster. It should get an idea of why they should come see your poster just by your title. Get some background or introduction. There should be some big picture ideas, as well as your observations that you use to generate your hypothesis, which should stand alone. I prefer to have a standalone hypothesis to make it very clear what I'm testing, what my goal is. Uh, some people will kind of tie this into the end of the background or introductions section. Stylistically, I think it makes a much clearer uh, presentation to just have it stand alone. Finally, your methods. This should set up your results, because the focus of your, of your poster is going to be your results. Your methods section to give enough information so that your results make sense. What experiments did you do? How did you quantify them? What comparisons did you make? And your results uh, typically will uh, comprise of about two to four different figures. Now, you don't want to try to take up the whole thing with one figure, because that's an empty poster. You also don't want to try to cram six or seven figures in. Keep your story concise and succinct. And if you have additional data, maybe you can store that digitally or have an iPad on hand. You can get creative with how you assemble that. But on your poster, on your physical poster, you should have a pretty clear, pretty straightforward message that you're trying to convey that should lead very strongly into your conclusions. I like to have my last figure be my strongest piece of data, my most compelling piece of data, maybe not my most visually striking, so it should go in the middle. But this should lead into my conclusions, which directly tie back into my hypothesis, my objective, and my big picture idea from my introduction. And then finally, throw in some references and acknowledgments as you need. Uh, make sure you cite other people's sources, even if it's just at the bottom of your poster. Uh, alignment here is going to be really critical. Uh, nobody wants to look at a sloppy poster, and you should use the white space in between your sections to kind of break things up, make things more manageable. Again, you don't want to overload, overload your viewer, overload your audience. You want to make things pretty straightforward, as straightforward as you can, and to here's this section, here's this piece of data, here's this piece of data, and let me uh, bring you through that. Finally, keep text minimal. I see junior trainees make this mistake all the time where they feel like they have to put every bit of information that they ever knew about their poster on the poster board. Keep text minimal, know that you will be there. You can add some context, you can describe things. You do not need to put every bit of text into your poster. You will be there to add that detail. And finally, check your poster at full size before you print. Learn from the mistakes of probably everybody in this room who has ever printed a poster. Look for typos. Make sure that your figures are at a good resolution for when you're going to print them at four feet wide. Know that you are going to make mistakes in assembling your poster. Get as many pairs of eyes on it at full scale before you print it as you can, and that will save you a lot of awkward headaches when you fly for three hours, hang it up, and notice a really bad typo. So, for example, uh, taking the data that we've already gone through, I'm going to start with a good title at the top, Nuclear Stiffness Directly Correlates with Endothelial Cell Response to Vascular Physiological Forces. 
anybody interested in nuclear stiffness or endothelial cells or vascular forces is going to come by my poster. You're going to see it in the uh, abstract list and say, oh, that looks missing. Let's go and look at it. My background introduction should be a big picture rationale. I'm trying to look at possibly uh, vascular disease progression and treatment. I'm going to tell them my observations that we can change nuclear stiffness, that the nucleus anchors uh, the structure of the cell, and that cells align on, based on fluid flow, and we don't really know why. That will lead to my hypothesis, which stands alone, saying that nuclear, nuclear stiffness modulates cell response to fluid flow. In my method section, I'm going to tell my experimental model, the cell line I'm using, uh, the experimental conditions, the different drugs, uh, any additional material for re or reagents, including my microscope or my camera that I use, and finally, my quantification method and statistics. If you're unsure what to include in this section, look at the y-axis of your data, of those charts. That will tell you how much detail you need to include to make sure that those results make sense. And then, each figure is basically a slide from a talk. Each uh, title, instead of being at the top of the slide, is now at the top of your uh, figure legend caption. So, for example, soft nuclei cause faster alignment under flow, stiff nuclei inhibit alignment under flow, and then finally, what I consider to be the most interesting piece of data, a new one, is that cells with soft nuclei align under low shear stress. If I drop the flow rate by half, then we still see the same phenomenon. So that's telling us that this phenomenon is conserved whether we're looking at arteries or veins or even smaller vessels and capillaries. That could be really interesting. And that will lead to my conclusions that nuclear stiffness modulates cell response to flow, tying back into my hypothesis, and these findings could impact our understanding of vascular biology and how we can treat vessel disease and all kinds of great stuff. In a little more detail, here's one of my uh, posters from last year where I presented at the American Heart Association. I've got my descriptive title telling you that uh, narrowing the perinexus improves cardiac induction. I tell you what the perinexus is in my introduction, in case you don't know, which I'm guessing nobody here does, it's a tiny nano domain in between cardiac cells, which we think could impact how cells communicate. My hypothesis is that expanding or narrowing this tiny face could impact cardiac function. And then my most visually striking piece of data, my prettiest picture is front and center. And this, I'm saying that based on whatever additive I put in my solution, which I then pump through a heart, I can change conduction velocity. I can change how the heart responds. And I can then frame my story off of this. I can say, here are some changes. What caused these changes? Well, it's not connection expression or interstitial volume, which we typically associate uh, as factors with cardiac induction, but it is the spacing of this perinexus. And that strongly goes into my conclusions, tying back to my hypothesis that the perinexus is a main driver in uh, determining cardiac induction. This could have a really big impact on how we treat cardiovascular disease and how we diagnose it. And, different factors that go into that. So with all of that, you have now assembled your poster. The next challenge is presenting your poster. And again, this can be very intimidating because you're going to be standing in one spot for about two hours making awkward eye contact with strangers. So number one, make sure you stand off to the side and don't block your poster. Uh, be ready to give about a three minute presentation. And importantly, you should be able to start this presentation at any point in your poster because people are going to walk up and they're going to, you know, Stay for a minute and look at it and say, oh, take me through your poster. That'll start the three minutes. Or, hey, figure two, what'd you do over here? And you'd be able to give in about 20 seconds the background, why you did what you did, and what that figure means, and then continue on. Be sure that you take your time. Go slow. Be ready to answer questions as you go. Practice this with your colleagues, with your lab mates. Know that this is intended to be an interactive, back-and-forth type medium. And finally, let your data tell your story. Don't feel like you have to rush through everything and say, oh, we did all this stuff and this is this. No. Let your data, as you have presented it, as you've clearly laid it out, make your point and tell your story. So I gave you all a whole bunch of stuff in the last hour plus at this point. So no matter what, always keep in mind that overall research question. As I mentioned, that's going to drive every decision you make from start to finish. Use standardized methods or make your own as you need. Remember that the method you choose should answer that question, should test your hypothesis. That's the goal. Not to show that you can run a Western blot or you can optically nap a heart, but that the method you choose is appropriate for answering your specific question. Use your statistics appropriately. Make sure that you can justify every test that you've done. Assemble your data to make those comparisons obvious. And make sure you, overall that your data clearly supports your main point. Again, you and your audience should draw the same conclusion 
once you've gone through all of your data. And then tailor that data presentation to the medium you use, whether that's a manuscript, a talk, a poster, however you do it. As an audience member, on the other hand, as you're sitting through talks, as you're reading papers, as you're uh, going through posters, use these points to evaluate the scientific work in front of you. Is their method appropriate? Is this an appropriate way to test that hypothesis? Are there statistics valid? Do they have a justification for using a t-test or chi-squared or an ANOVA in particular? Are the author's points supported by the data they've presented? It is not uncommon to get through a journal club and get to the end and say, well, the author's main conclusion is this. And everyone looks at each other and says, that's not at all what they actually said. So make sure in presenting your data and drawing your conclusions that those conclusions are supported by the data you have actually presented. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention, uh, the Wright Center and the library and the postdoctoral association for letting me talk to you all. Uh, our lab, led by our fearless leader, Dr. Daniel Conway, and his funding for giving me a job, and also for uh, providing a lot of the data that we've shown here today. I hope you all found this informative and useful, and thank you all very much.